one of the one of the people I respected most in the world was a Cobra pilot. I'd flown with him several times, many times actually. He and I were pretty tight. And he told me one day, he says, he says, Hank, I don't think I'm going to make it. I think I'm going to die. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm sure of it. He says, I feel bad about it because all I want to really do is go home and raise my kids. So I told him, I says, park this son of a bitch. Don't die. You don't have to die. He said, if I don't do it, if I don't stay on, stay on the job, somebody else will have to die in my place. I said, bullshit. Don't do that. Get out of it. A few days later, we had a scramble. We only scrambled for one thing, downed aircraft. And and our part of our mission in that unit was recovering all the downed aircraft in, in the area. So we took off. It wasn't very far away. I could see the smoke plume from the helicopter that had been shot down. Black smoke. So I I went in front seat in the Cobra with another guy. And we went out there, and we just got over the, the crash site, started a rotation. My buddy was ahead of us a little bit. So he, sw he swung out first. We swung in behind him. And he got shot down. Uh, 51 caliber machine gun, which shoots around about as big around as your finger, and then they shoot them close together and with lots of power. Our 50 caliber machine gun had an effective range of about 2,000 yards. Not bad. Their 12.7, which is 51 caliber, had an effective range of 3,300 yards. It's a nasty son of a bitch. And he was hit. The pilot was hit. And a rotor blade was hit. And the rotor, bail, rotor blade peeled back. Well, you can do lots of things with one wing. Unless you're a helicopter and you can't do anything with one wing. So he turned over and he went into the ground, upside down. It was a hell of a day. So there was the aircraft we went out to recover. There was my buddy 2-2. Two -two. And we lost a scout plane that day, too. The four guys on the, on the Huey were killed. My buddy and his co-pilot, which was, was one of my, which he was my roomie. He was killed. The scout crew got out okay. Don't really know why they crashed, but uh, they might have lost power. They might have just had pilot air or whatever, but they crashed. Got them out okay. Right by where they crashed, there, were, there was a trail, and it had the tracks of a gun carriage. And... Uh, so they, we, we knew where they'd gone, but we couldn't go after them because they were going right into a, a friendly unit. According to our maps, and I'm not sure our maps were correct, but we didn't pursue them. It was time to cut our losses and go home, which we did. Uh, why that machine gun took them instead of us, I have no idea. We were at least as good a target as him. But they, they took him and never fired at us. We never took a round of fire net. That was one of the worst days of my life. 
I've lived it over many times. In the hell of it. And he knew he was going to die. He was a he was a wonderful pilot, a good guy, courageous son of a bitch. When I became a scout, which was not too long after that, uh, I had not realized until then how dangerous scout filing was. And I knew if I was going to do it, I was going to have to find a way to not be afraid all the time. Scared pilots die, and they cause other havoc. It's just, no, if you're going to do it, you gotta, you got to be bold. And by God, I was bold. Flew lots of missions. There, was, there were several times when I threw at least 30 days consecutive, every day for 30 days. At least. So I knew I couldn't be scared all the time. So what I decided was, one, I can't be killed. Bullets can't touch me. Anyhow, that's where I flew. They can't kill me. So I flew like that. And they couldn't kill me. They shot me down five times. <laughs> but I never got a scratch. I had one gunner got a bruise on his heel from around and went through the heel of his boot. That's the closest I, I came to having somebody taken out. They came up with a program because the war was, they were trying to wind the war down a little bit where you could get an early out if you extended your turf for six months. I was ready to get out. And I was not a good soldier. Uh, I wanted to do things my way and only my way. Which had worked okay for me. But you can do things and say things that alienate a lot of people. And I did that. And my judgment was slipping. I thought I knew more about flying a helicopter and killing gooks than anybody alive, which wasn't true. There were a lot of wise, experienced people that, that knew more than me, and I wouldn't listen to any of them. So eventually, being a very strong-willed and independent person that I was, I crossed the line a little bit too far. So I got my third Article 15, which is, it's not a good thing to do. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't help your military career. And, uh, so my commanding officer says, you're not going to stay in the Army. You can finish your tour, but then you'll be out because I'm putting a letter of reprimand in your file. You're done. That, my, my ego is pretty strong and took a lot of crushing, but he crushed it. And it's what he should have done. It was the right thing. I didn't feel that way then. I thought, oh, that son of a bitch, he, he hates me. <laughs> and maybe he did. <laughs> uh,
But I did my, my tour extension, and I'd been doing it for, I don't know, three months, four months. And I got a, I got a call from the office, and I said, if you extend it, get out early. Yeah, yeah, you can get out right now. So I collected my shit and was on the next chopper for my Benoit. You know, and it was, you, de you, you develop certain anxieties surrounding certain things. And, and I thought, you know, I think Duke bastards really hate me. They're going to find a way to kill me. So I'm walking along the airstrip at Benoit, and I look down the airstrip, and I can see this thing coming. It's an airplane. It's a jet. It's a freaking MiG. He got run alongside of me, and he pointed it straight up and hit the afterburner. And, wow, that thing went up fast. And I thought, they come all this way to kill me. Well, in fact, what had happened was a North Vietnamese pilot had flown his MiG south and surrendered it. And the Air Force jet jockeys are out there playing with it, <laughs> which any sane jet jockey would do. <laughs> But I took it personal. I thought they were coming to kill me. They tried so long, so hard that they just couldn't let it go, and now they were going to get me. But they didn't. I got home on Christmas Day. The trip home was kind of unusual. We landed in Hawaii. They told us not to get off the plane for more than a few minutes because we're just refueling and then we were headed on. I got off the plane and went into a bar. I didn't want to drink. I just wanted a Coke. So I sat down at the table and this waitress came out and she says, she got a nice smile on. She says, so tell me, how many babies did you kill today? I have never been a person who was at a loss for words for very long, and I wasn't then. I said, none, but it's been kind of a slow day. <laughs> so I didn't get my Coke. <laughs> I got back on the plane, came home. Had to wait in, uh, uh, it was, uh, San Francisco, I think, for a little while before they before I could get a flight out of there. I went to the airport, wearing my cab hat, dress uniform, medals hanging off of me. Boy, it was something. Had a cab back on each shoulder. <laughs> so I'm looking for a place to sit on and wait for a plane. I spot a place. Looks like it's yeah, nobody there. So I went over there and sat down. And this pretty young Vietnamese woman walked from behind me, went a few rows, grabbed this child out of his sheet, and took off. And she was looking at me like she was looking at the devil. That didn't feel good. Didn't feel good at all. It kind of, I guess it kind of prepared me for what life was going to be like for a little while. So people talk about the shock and, and how badly they were treated when they got home. I hadn't even gotten home and I was treated bad. It was okay. Fuck it. When I was processing out of the Army in, in California, which I had to do, I guess if you had certain things on your record they needed to talk to before they let you go. Things like Article 15 and letters of reprimand and shit like that. So I sat down with a psychiatrist, and he said, tell me about yourself. And I said, what do you want to know? What'd you do? He said, well, I killed a lot of people, some of which didn't need to die. 
But I wanted to kill him, and I did. And now I want to go home. He said, okay. And he let me go home. <laughs> but I could have, you know, I said, I told him, I said, I am, I'm a mess. I don't know how to survive out here. And he says, well, we can hospitalize you if that's what you want. It was the day before Christmas. I wanted to go home. And I told him, I said, right now, I just want to go home. Maybe I should be in the hospital. But I want to go home. So they let me go home. Flew into Missoula, got on a Greyhound bus, got off at Tarku, and with my devil bag over my shoulder, I walked home. My mom did not know I was coming. My stepdad was supposed to come up to the bus and get me. But he didn't. He was doing a, cry. He was doing a puzzle. <laughs> So he didn't. I forgave him. He was a good guy. I'm from a small town in Montana, not Missoula. I didn't live there. Superior. About a thousand people. And they had bars in Superior. I needed those bars. Those bars needed me. <laughs> so I commenced to drink. I didn't work. I drank. That was my job. And I drank quite a bit. Finally, my unemployment went out, so I went to work. I had to go to work. Nobody's going to pay me to sit on my ass and drink. My nerves were all used up. I went to work in the mill, and I worked there for a little while. I thought, I'll go take some flying lessons. I'll get some better qualifications, and I'll go to, I'll go to goddamn Alaska and be a bush pilot. Good idea. Flying scared the shit out of me. I had done the scariest things you can do in a helicopter. Didn't even blink. Meant nothing. Now I decided it meant something, and I was going to die. I was so frickin' scared. I hate that. I've always hated being scared. It used to be I could overcome it by attacking it. That was all used up. My nerves were used up. I drank a lot for a while. I got married to the wrong woman. But she did something for me that needed to be done. I was, I was drinking and kind of wild and kind of troublesome. So one day, she, one evening, she put me in the car and she says, you sit down and you shut up. She drove me over across town. She said, there's an AA meeting in there. You get out of this car and you go in there and do what they do or don't come home. So I did. She was a sorry wife, but she was what I needed then. So I got sober. Another couple of months, good willing and good Lord willing, the creek don't rise. I live fifty years sobriety. Fifty. Nobody gets fifty. But in a couple of months, I'll have fifty, unless I die. And I'm not real healthy, so I could die. <laughs> but uh, I feel good about that, about being able to stay sober. Odds, odds against it were pretty long. 